Let's do this. I don't know what it is about good films that somehow always ends up as bad or average video games. It seems that every time there's a game based off a quality movie, the game then isn't quite up to the same standard. I think you can definitely say that's the case with the Matrix series, with Enter the Matrix and The Path of Neo. Starship Troopers was also a pretty damn good film, and it has one of the worst video games ever made based off it too. A game that's so bad that it's used as a torture method at CIA black sites. Burn, buggies, burn! Another really good example is Die Hard Vendetta, obviously based off the Die Hard films, which are some of the best action films of all time. Well, the first and third film are anyway. I'm kind of indifferent to Die Hard 2, even though it has some of the most obvious cut to a stuntman shots I've ever seen in a movie. And I just want to pretend that everything that came out after the third film never existed. <laughs> oh god, I love this country. Die Hard's always kind of had an interesting history with video games. There was the game based off the first film on the NES, and we all know how that turned out. There was Die Hard Arcade, a beat-em-up that was actually kind of awesome and had a surprisingly complex moveset. And then there was Die Hard Trilogy on the PlayStation. Not a great game, but still a bit of a guilty pleasure. In 2002, there was Die Hard Nakatomi Plaza, a pretty low-rate first-person shooter that was based off the first film. I don't know it, I'm telling you. Get on a jet to Tokyo and ask the chairman. Now I know what a TV dinner feels like. If the first film had John McClane shooting several dozen terrorists instead of just a handful, and if he ran out of breath every five seconds from physical exertion. Yeah, that game sucked. Okay. Keeping in that FPS vein was Die Hard Vendetta released for the PlayStation 2 and the GameCube also in 2002, developed by Bits Studios. Even though I've owned this thing for over a decade, it's only just now that I'm finally getting around to doing a video on it. It's kind of like dealing with a traumatic event by facing the pain head on and trying to gain some sense of closure. This was actually one of the first games I ever tried to review for my channel, but I had a hard drive break at the time, losing a whole heap of footage that I'd captured, causing me to rethink my life choices up until that point and if the game was even worth covering. <laughs> you remember that scene in the first film how McLean shouts out, Welcome to the party, pal? Welcome to the party, pal! It was kind of endearing and it mirrored how the stakes in the film were beginning to ramp up. As the viewer, you were past the point of no return, you were strapped in for the ride and you knew that you weren't leaving at this point until the credits rolled. Well, in Die Hard Vendetta, John says the same thing, but only now when he says it, it's so depressing, it's like it's the beginning of a eulogy. Welcome to the party, pal. This one line sums up how I feel about the whole game, and I couldn't have delivered it better myself if I tried. Welcome to the party, pal. Right, so the whole thing takes place after the third film, with John now working for the LAPD alongside his daughter Lucy. McLean, sadly not voiced by Bruce Willis though, who was probably off reinforcing his status as a career prick at the time. And instead the guy in his place is doing what could be described as a barely serviceable impression. Look Al, I'm not leaving. No, I'm not in uniform, so if I get spotted I'll just make like I was a guest who got lost. It's over. Yeah, for you. What's funny too is that it's the same voice actor who did McLean for Nakatomi Plaza. And I'd even say that his Schwarzenegger is better than his Willis. At least he kind of looks like Bruce Willis though, I guess. I mean, for some reason he's constantly wearing a singlet in this throughout all of the cinematics. Now look, I know it's supposed to be a reference to the first film, but the only reason John was wearing a singlet in the movie was because it was in the middle of changing clothes at the same time Hans Gruber and his buddy showed up and he didn't have time to put a t-shirt on. It was supposed to also reinforce that image of him just being this average guy who found himself in a really serious and deadly situation and also heightened his vulnerability. Somehow made him seem even more at risk. He wasn't sneaking around in a bulletproof vest, I mean the guy couldn't even get a pair of shoes that fit. Even then, in Die Hard 3, he was only in a singlet right at the end of the film because he had to take his shirt off and use it as a makeshift towel to wipe some guy's brains off his face. It was an outfit that came out of necessity, not choice, and I mean I highly doubt that if John could go back and do it all over again, he'd choose to run around barefoot in a chesty bond. The only way they could have shown that they missed the point of this even more was if he didn't even have any shoes on either. I mean, am I overthinking it? Maybe I'm overthinking it. I wasn't going to mention that. As a consolation though, we do get the return of Reggie Johnson as Sergeant Powell, who also voiced the same character in Die Hard Nakatomi Plaza. Alright cowboy, you did good. 
Sadly though, there's no Mary Elizabeth Winstead voicing Lucy, which is a real shame because goddamn son, she fine. Anyway, back to the game. Now, in some lame way to connect this to the films, one of the main antagonists is Hans Gruber's son, Piet, who's working with a military group led by a guy named Frontier. At the start of the game, Gruber's involved in some kind of art heist, with John and Lucy quickly being drawn into it. What turns out to be a simple heist though, they soon learn was a means to fund the acquisition of a missile of some shady Japanese arms dealers. It has been pleasure doing business with you which Piet is then planning to use to hold LA hostage for one billion dollars. It's definitely a lot more diehard with a vengeance than just diehard, with John frantically running around the city to try to put the pieces together, hunting the terrorists down and avoiding death at every turn. Pleasure. You'll move down Hollywood Boulevard, then a Chinese cinema, the LA subway before a movie studio, then a couple of fish factories before it all wraps up back at Ground Zero, Nakatomi Plaza. Expect the unexpected. You kinda gotta give them credit for trying to mix up these environments as much as possible, and I mean if nothing else, you can't say it's lacking variety. It's everything else though where it is lacking, and that's when it kinda sucks. Vendetta just has one of the most stock lineup of weapons I think I've ever seen in a video game, and you could probably guess what these are before I even told you. Gunshots? You've got a generic revolver, a 9mm pistol, an Uzi, and an assault rifle as well as a sniper rifle, rocket launcher, and then later in the game an XM-29 rifle, which just started popping up heaps in first-person shooters at the time for some reason. There's a flamethrower that shows up for all of one level, and then MP5s at Nakatomi Plaza that the game calls tactical SMGs. And I even came across a Desert Eagle at 1.2, but you've seen all of these a hundred times. Exactly. I think the biggest issue is that none of these guns are all that fun to use, and what's not helping either is the weapon reload times. Even just the time it takes to change between these weapons is so slow, it's like making this some of the most unsatisfying shooting you'll ever experience. Exactly. The Uzi, I think, is the biggest offender here, and it actually takes longer to reload it than you spend shooting it. I'm not even kidding. I mean, you should always be able to fire a weapon longer than it takes to reload, like that's just basic game design, right? Now you can dual wield a lot of these guns, and dual wielding the 9mm pistols has its moments, but the general lack of impactful sound effects and damage indicators showing where you're getting hit from just makes the shooting feel unresponsive. Luckily it has a really generous auto-aim system, I mean all you gotta do is pretty much aim in the direction of an enemy, and then the lock-on does the rest. Maybe this is for the best though, because the frame rate is about as unreliable as an alcoholic with a welfare payment. It just doesn't control very well either. The game has this stupid auto jump mechanic on by default, where the game jumps if you walk off a ledge. Which I think is supposed to help you during the platforming sections, but when you're trying to drop off something to just get down a level, you know what happens? Yeah, you're gonna jump. And then it just causes needless fall damage, so first thing you gotta do is turn that shit off. You step, asshole. Now with these controls, I can only really speak for the PlayStation 2 version, which is the only version of the game that I've ever played. I know this thing was also on the GameCube in the Xbox, but I don't really think it would be all that better off on either of those consoles. It's kind of like saying that drinking piss is going to taste better if you drink it out of a champagne glass instead of a tumbler. Yeah, I recently acquired the taste. Anyway, look man, we're getting sidetracked, and let me just say that I did try to find some positive things to talk about with the shooting, and I can say with authority that some of the animations look okay. As slow as it is, I do think the relay animation for the Uzi looks kind of good. You can see John hold the spare magazine in his offhand while he reloads before he then puts the fresh one in. Like, it looks pretty smooth. There's a few animations for enemies that looks pretty good too. Watching them keel and stagger when they're shot at, throwing them off balance for a few seconds is kind of impressive. Don't build them like they used to. And it kind of reminds me of playing Perfect Dark and how you'd see enemies topple over if you hit them in certain body parts. It also tries to introduce a bunch of mechanics. One of them is a bullet time replay, where it shows the death dealing bullet flying towards an enemy in super slow motion like you're playing Max Payne or something. Outside of that, you'll also see death cams during combat, again kinda like Max Payne, where the camera's gonna focus on a single enemy. But it's not like there's any blood or any kind of impressive physics to it, it's just like a slow motion shot of an enemy falling over. It's like watching an old person falling over in slow motion. Well, I take that back, at least watching an old person fall over is kinda funny. <laughs> 
final mode is a mechanic called Hero Time, where you press down the left and the right thumbstick at the same time, and then the action slows down to a crawl. But for some reason, you can still move around normally and fire weapons really quickly. All while Beethoven's Ode to Joy plays in the background. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of cool, I guess, but once you've activated it, you can't turn it off. It's a one-time deal. And again, like McLean wearing a singlet the entire time, this also makes no sense to me. The only reason they used that song in the first movie was because it took place around Christmas. Playing it now in this, it seems just, again, kind of pointless. Merry Christmas. But look, I guess if we start trying to make sense of all the things in this game that are utter nonsense, well, we're going to be here until we all start bleeding from our assholes. Exactly. I will give credit where credit is due, and I do have to admit that Vendetta at least has some pretty interesting objectives from level to level. These aren't always straightforward, it's never just about moving down corridors and shooting bad guys. One of the earliest levels in the game, you're walking down Hollywood Boulevard and it's kinda like the bad guys are celebrating some kind of crime holiday or something. Because every second business on the street is getting robbed or attacked by dropouts from a Charles Bronson Death Wish film. What you do here is interrupt a few gangbangers in the middle of robbing a clothes store, and you have to sneak up and interrogate one of these guys, which causes the other ones to drop their guns, which allows you to then arrest them. Whoa, hold on, homeboy. Later on, you're in a record store, and the poor guy behind the counter is trying to subtly tell McLean that there's another robber hiding behind the counter by speaking in code, which for some reason John is completely oblivious to. Hey, listen, I'm not interested in. Die, motherfucker! There's even little clever moments that they've added in, like searching through the dressing rooms for bad guys and finding some poor bimbo hiding inside in nothing but her underwear. <laughs> Oops, my mistake. Or a pair of oblivious teenagers hiding in an alley trying to make out in the middle of a crime spree. Tommy, he's creeping me out. Do you mind? No, not at all. Dude, you're spoiling the moment. You get my drift. And it's like the small details like this that make the world seem a bit more lifelike and fleshed out. Die, you piece of shit! Each mission often involves talking to a lot of NPCs, using them as a means to find key items, or just having to hand key items over to them to progress. Take this key card, it'll open up the sound stages. Later in the game, you're inside a fish factory, and you gotta shoot holes in a fish tank to create a pool of water, causing a crate to float up so you can jump across. The thing is, on the flip side of this, there's some stuff that you're required to do in this game that's just so obscure and poorly communicated that it's amazing that people could even figure this stuff out back in the day without some kind of a walkthrough. I mean, here is an absolute doozy, right? At one point, John is arrested and sent to prison because he accidentally assaults an actress, so he's sent to a maximum security prison as punishment. Yeah, that makes sense. Anyway, what you got to do here is get out of your cell, right? First off, you got to silently take out two patrolling guards who are both armed with shotguns by sneaking up behind them without being seen. After that, you need to find a pack of cigarettes, then ask one of the inmates for a light. Don't mind if I do. Then you take that lit cigarette and ignite a shit-stained mattress in an empty cell. I don't know, maybe it's flammable shit. Once you've lit the mattress on fire, a guard from downstairs then leaves his post to extinguish it. Avoiding this guy, you've got to sneak past him and hide in a locker behind his station. Then wait for him to come back from putting out the fire before you can then sneak through a nearby gate and get to the next area. And this all has to be done perfectly or else you have to do it all right from the beginning. I mean, in what fucking universe is someone going to figure out all of this stuff on their own? Oh, this is a dumb idea, John. Later in the game, you're in this kind of a warehouse and there's a large gap that you can't jump across. So to get across it, you've got to shoot these balloons so they deflate and drop down, giving you precious seconds to use them as a platform and leap across. Yeah, and once again, if you mess the timing and screw it up, it's back to the start of the level. Even simple puzzles often have confusing solutions, like in the subway level, you've got to find a pair of keys to start this construction lift. And they're hidden in some kind of random toolbox, but the toolbox just looks like one of the dozens of other props you've never had to interact with. So why you're suddenly gonna think to try to open this one is just beyond me. Bingo. This also comes from that Dark Ages in console gaming before they introduced checkpoints. Checkpoints, which show some kind of consideration for the player's time. 
and Die Hard Vendetta is one of those asshole games where every time you die, you're back to the beginning of the current level. Each chapter might have three or four transitions, but these can sometimes go for 15 or 20 minutes. So if you die during any of these, it's still gonna put you right back. Holy Toledo. I just never understood this mentality in gaming at the time, like it never made sense to me. Even the original Super Mario Brothers, as challenging as that game was, it still had mid-level checkpoints. If you died, which was likely, it'd still start you from halfway through the level. And here we are, 16 fucking years later with Die Hard Vendetta, and we may as well be back in the damn Stone Age, whacking each other with femurs and flinging shit at our own shadows. It's beautiful, no? We had this period in the early and mid 2000s where developers just ignored that basic concept of gaming convenience. It's like, yeah, we've got these new consoles and we're gonna have better graphics and better gameplay, but checkpoints, they've gotta go. Yeah, and I love the little tip the game gives you on the game over screen. Try and stay alive? Yeah, thanks for the tip, idiot. Die, you piece of shit! And the reason it becomes a real problem in this game is because sometimes it can be so easy to fail one of your objectives. A lot of these are designed in a way where it's really impossible to know what's going to happen if it's your first time playing. Like this bit here in the Chinese theatre, right? You open the first door you see and it kills this poor guy. Hey, who's that? The reason for that is because there's some kind of laser sensor in front of the door and opening it sets it off. But I mean, you're not gonna possibly know about that the first time it happens. You okay? Well, I am now, sweetie. And how about this bit here, right? Where these two guys are being held hostage. You wanna know how you beat it? By shooting the terrorists? No, see this vent all the way up there? Yeah, you've gotta shoot it, causing all of these fish to drop out, which then makes the bad guys drop their hostages. Innocuous elements like this in the environment are not clever. It's just bad design for not letting the player know that it exists in the first place and in a cohesive manner. This is also one of the stingiest games I think I've ever played when it comes to the healing items too. For the final level in the game, you literally don't get a single medkit, and you're somehow expected to survive against a couple of dozen soldiers. Not to mention a combat chopper and two missile launchers. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Oh yeah, and another thing, a medkit doesn't even fully heal you. It only restores 50 health points, making it even more stingy. The only way to make it through some of these final levels is to know the locations of enemies beforehand, right? Because you're simply not going to make it through the game unless you know their exact positions ahead of time. And this is one of the reasons I've still never beaten this game, because the last level is just such a clusterfuck of cheap, irritating and lame design. Trying to pass itself off as challenging and difficult when it's really just starving the player of basic items they need to survive. And ultimately the only thing that's dying hard with this game is my patience. Let me just say that if you managed to beat this thing as a kid, well, my hat goes off to you. And all I can say is that you must be one patient little son of a bitch. Roger, no problem. Now this thing also comes with a bunch of making of videos included as special features on the main menu. This actually goes pretty deep into some aspects of the game development and why they made certain choices. And even though it sounds like they made a diehard game simply because they had the rights to it and nothing else, I still do get the gist that these guys did the best they could, which is what makes it even more painful when you consider how terrible it is. We wanted to allow the player to have more flexibility in what they chose to do. No one wants to see nice people fail, unless it's old people. I mean, I could watch those guys fall downstairs all day. <laughs> Die Hard Vendetta isn't the worst FPS I've ever played, but look, let me just say, it's definitely up there. Ah, uh, don't worry, Rico. Soon you'll be lying on a beach earning 20%. Get moving, asshole. But if you're looking for that authentic yippee experience, well, you're not gonna find it here, that's for damn sure. But at least there's evidence of an attempt being made here to make this thing somewhat decent. And I'll play any damn video game that's got Reggie Johnson voicing one of the characters. Life is a 